HPLC, High Performance Liquid Chromatography. HPLC is simply chromatography where our mobile phase is liquid and the stationary phase is either a solid or a liquid bonded to a solid. In comparison to GC, gas chromatography, HPLC is more expensive and it generates more waste. However, not all compounds are volatile enough to be analyzed in GC, therefore HPLC is quite common. HPLC instrumentation. What's shown here is an HPLC MS instrument where mass spectrometry is used as the detector for HPLC. You'll notice that there's an auto sampler allowing for quick analysis that is unsupervised of your samples. There is a small column, it's metallic, you'll see it in the inset on the right hand side. The metal is just the steel sheath for the insides of the column. And that's usually contained in a column oven, so you can control the temperature of your separation. Then there's an injection valve, pumps. You may have multiple pumps. Usually there's somewhere between two and four pumps so that you can dynamically mix multiple mobile phases together. Then you're going to have to have some kind of detector. This presentation will talk about a number of different detectors. In the case of having a mass spectrometer as your detector, you're going to need to have some way of getting the molecules ionized. And what's shown here is an atmospheric pressure chemical ionization interface. The schematic of the instrument is going to vary depending on the age of the schematic, the age of the instrument, and so on. What we have is a bunch of different solvent reservoirs, basically they're bottles with lines in them. In the lines you have some sort of sinker that's going to be filtering out the mobile phase as you inlet it in. In this diagram there's also a regulated helium source that is shown, and that helium source is connected to things called spargers. This is a way to remove dissolved gases from your mobile phase so that you don't get air bubbles in your system. Typically, helium sparging has been replaced in modern HPLCs using a degasser unit, but once the mobile phase has been pumped, it has been mixed in the proportioning valve, then it's going to go through your pumps to a pulse damper, which is going to prevent surges as each pump go back and forth. And then it has the choice to go through your sample, which is actually going through a filter and then a back pressure regulator, a pressure transducer, and your injector valve to your column and then to a detector. You'll usually notice that there's some kind of drain valve or a priming syringe in between the pump and the column so that you're able to change out solvents and remove air bubbles from the system. The pump system itself has a piston pump, which is going to be moving a piston back and forth. The details of this really aren't necessary for someone who's using an HPLC to understand, but what is important to realize is that you do have a pulse damper. As you watch the pressure of your HPLC system, you shouldn't see a sawtooth format. If you're seeing a sawtooth, you probably have an air bubble somewhere, meaning that the pump has lost its prime. It can be a little bit more helpful for you to understand how the injection works for HPLC. It's using something called a six port injector. What that means is that there are six different channels for the fluid to go through. And depending on which position the injector is in, whether it's the load position as drawn on the left, or the injection position as drawn on the right, you're going to get a different flow between these channels. When in the load position, the fluid is going to go from your syringe through the ports to fill a fixed volume sample loop. Then it'll go out the back of it to waste, so you can fill that loop completely. When you switch the position of the switch from load to inject, then the flow of the solvent will be from the solvent in, from the pumps, to the sample loop, through then to the column, in order to move your sample onto the column for separation. Detection in HPLC can take such a huge variety of forms, but almost always you're going to have some sort of spectrophotometry, so you can do absorbance in the UV or visible range. This is always fun because we talk about spectrometers like they're a little standalone instrument, but they're really quite a common detector for other things as well. If you have a nicer HPLC, it can let you pick a wavelength so you're not stuck monitoring only at 254 nanometers, or you can pick multiple wavelengths. Even better is to use a diode array spectrometer, where we have the sample flow cell from the HPLC as part of the spectrometer itself. That's shown in the center of this image. Then what happens is you pass your light through that, and you're able to then separate the wavelengths after the sample and detect along a whole array of photodiodes. That allows you to monitor multiple wavelengths at once and get a snapshot of a spectrum.
But spectroscopy is not the only detector for HPLC. Ultraviolet is pretty common, but other ones that are pretty common are refractive index, electrochemical detection, and mass spectrometry. All of the detectors here are used for different applications, and as with GC, we do have to worry about what our detection limit is. You'll notice that the detection limit in nanograms is massive material that you can detect, and mass spectrometry has a pretty good detection limit, but it's actually on par with UV as an HPLC detector. Another thing you'll notice is whether this is useful with a gradient. Remember that a gradient is changing the composition of your mobile phase as you go through your chromatography. Refractive index detection and electrochemical detection are not useful with gradients because they actually depend partly on what your solvent is. Let's talk about the stationary phase. The columns for HPLC are almost always packed. They're packed with different particles, and that depends on your analyte. The fact is, though, that analytical columns that actually do the separation are expensive, and they're easily degraded. If you have dust or particles in your samples, you're going to clog this. The pore sizes are small. So what you'll do is you'll introduce a guard column, which is short, expendable. This is basically your disposable protection and this should be packed with the same material as your analytical column. It protects the analytical column not only from particles, but also from irreversible absorption if you have something that's never going to leave your column. As a result, you should always filter everything that's going to enter an HPLC. For that matter, filter anything that's going into your GC too. At least a 0.5 micron filter needs to be used. You can use syringe filters for your samples. They screw onto syringes, and then you can push your liquid through them into a vial. Or you can use a vacuum filtration setup with a higher volume capacity to filter solvents. So, is HPLC high performance or high pressure liquid chromatography? Really, I think the most accurate thing to say is high performance, but it is high pressure too. This is because almost all of the columns are packed, and the smaller packing is going to lead to higher liquid pressure because the particles are going to resist the flow of the liquid. But you want small particles. Small particles lead to better resolution. We'll talk about that in a moment, but don't forget that whole Van Diemter equation and the basics of chromatography. The fact is, solids diffuse way too slowly in liquids for an open tubular column to be practical for liquid chromatography. We have to use packed columns. Here's the Van Diemter curve that I mentioned. Small particle sizes are going to decrease your plate height and improve your resolution. In terms of the multiple path term, eddy diffusion, you're going to get fewer options for multiple paths, and you're going to get less of that diffusion. Also, if you have a smaller particle size, it'll take less time for mass transfer and equilibration between the mobile phase and the stationary phase. What that basically means is when you look at the plot here in the bottom, each of the different particle sizes, 5 microns all the way down to 1.8 microns, is going to have a different relationship of speed, flow rate, of your mobile phase, versus plate height, where we want a nice small plate height for better resolution. The smaller the particle, the better the resolution. Keep that in mind when you buy a column. The other thing to keep in mind, though, when you buy a column is that the smaller particle size is going to increase the pressure of your system. So you'll want to check that you have a maximum capacity of your pressure. This should be obtainable from the instrument manufacturer. Inside that packed column, we have nanometer-sized pores that are inside the network. So we talk about the size of the particle, and it could be a monolithic silica, which is shown here in the middle with SEM, scanning electron microscope images, or they could be silica beads, where you actually have a diameter of a particle. What you want to notice is that there's multiple levels of structure. There's the size of the particle, and then there's actually nanometer-sized pores within the network, which you can't even see on these images. Speaking of the pores, you don't have to have a completely porous particle. In this example, superficially porous particles, where it's only porous on the outside of the particle, can help to separate certain molecules, such as proteins, quickly. In essence, these particles act smaller than they really are in terms of the diffusion length, which means you get the good separation of a small particle size, but you also get the lower pressure characteristics of a bigger particle size. It's kind of like having the best of both worlds. The principle of separation in chromatography is really key to understand, particularly for HPLC. Because in HPLC, it's all about competition between solvent and solute molecules. So our solute contains our analyte, and it wants to bind on the stationary phase. And that is shown by the triangles. Then we have competition where the solvent is coming through, and the solvent also has affinity for the stationary phase. As the solvent displaces the analyte that kicks the analyte into solution and moves the analyte along, when the analyte moves along, then it's going to elute faster. 
This is described by a term called eluent strength. The stronger the mobile phase, the stronger the eluent is, then the more it's going to displace the solute. High eluent strength means that your analytes will be removed quickly. If we have a nonpolar stationary phase, then your nonpolar analyte will be more attracted to it, and a nonpolar solvent will have higher eluent strength and greater competition to displace the solute. In the last slide, when I mentioned the nonpolar stationary phase, that's called reverse phase chromatography. There are a lot of different types of HPLC, but the two main categories are normal phase and reverse phase. Normal phase came first, it was the first one invented, and in that case we have a polar stationary phase. And the more polar your solvent is, the higher the eluent strength is. Then came reverse phase, which is the opposite of normal phase. So we have a nonpolar stationary phase, and the less polar solvent has higher eluent strength. In general, you make a stronger eluent by making the mobile phase more like the stationary phase. In this graph, the difference in how compounds will elute is shown. On the left-hand side, we have polar stationary phase, on the right-hand side, we have nonpolar stationary phase, or reverse phase chromatography. The polarity of the analytes is A is more polar than B is more polar than C. In this graph, you'll notice that the polarity of the stationary phase determines the elution order. It determines whether A, being the most polar compound, is going to elute first or last. The polarity of the mobile phase that's moving things along is going to determine how quickly overall everything elutes. For example, if you look at the right-hand side, on the top we have a really polar mobile phase. For the reverse phase chromatography, a polar mobile phase has very little interaction with a non-polar stationary phase, so things take a while to elute. When you make that mobile phase less polar, more non-polar, the mobile phase is increasing in strength for our non-polar stationary phase, and things are eluting faster. Similar things happen for the normal phase chromatography. So what's the chemistry of that bead, you might wonder. We really have silica beads, and we have free OH groups on their surface. These can bond very strongly to polar solutes, and that causes tailing, where your peak spreads out afterwards. The other thing is that silica will dissolve in base above pH of 8, and so we can add ethylene bridges to make it resistant up to pH 12. Silica like this is used in normal phase chromatography as a very polar stationary phase. We also will bond different compounds to the silica in order to make nonpolar or intermediate polarity stationary phases. The reaction of that is shown here. We have silanol groups that can be reacted with chlorosilanols in order to attach R groups or organic groups. It's really best if you have multiple bonds to your stationary phase so that you have less bleed or less loss of the stationary phase over time. One of the most common columns used for reverse phase HPLC is the C18 column. We have the same silica bead that we were just talking about, but now what's happened is that we've functionalized the surface of it using a hydrocarbon that has 18 carbons in its backbone. So this is a nice, long, nonpolar hydrocarbon chain. Shown in the image here, there's also a cross-linking in between the silicon bonds, which makes the column more stable and prevents the column from bleeding over time. Common stationary phase choices are plotted in this table. If you want a nonpolar column, use some sort of C18, C8, C4 alkane. In that case, the retention of your compounds will be based on van der Waals interactions. You can also use a phenyl column for a nonpolar column, where the interactions are going to be based on hydrophobicity and pi pi interactions. Cyano and amido columns are going to be intermediate and polar or ionic, and they will be able to resolve more polar compounds. And then as I mentioned before, bare silica is very polar and will be retaining compounds based on their hydrogen bonding. Once you've chosen a column based on the polarity of your sample, then the next thing to optimize is the mobile phase in HPLC. The solvent polarity relates to eluent strength. This table is in reference to bare silica, which you'll remember is very polar with all of its silicon OH groups. So solvents with higher values of epsilon are more polar on this table. For example, then, as we look at this, pentane has an eluent strength of zero relative to bare silica, so it's extremely nonpolar. We can work through the table then to see that acetone is a bit more polar, and methanol is even more polar than that. What's important to realize is that a lot of times we'll talk about water as part of our mobile phase as well. Water's going to be more polar than any of these guys. So when we mix methanol and water, methanol is less polar than water. 
and the water will be the higher eluent strength for a normal phase chromatography. The other thing that you'll notice here is that the ultraviolet cutoff is listed. This is the wavelength below which the solvent absorbs significantly in the UV and lets you know whether your solvent will be useful for UV detection. We have a lot of different types of liquid chromatography and the choice of which one to use is determined by how big your molecule is and how polar it is. For molecules that are less than 2000 molecular weight, we have the question then of is it soluble in organic solvents or in water? On the right hand side of this tree, if it's soluble in water, then you'd ask is it ionic? And if it is, you'd use ion exchange chromatography. If it's not, then you can use some sort of normal phase chromatography and they list the columns that would be helpful. A lot of things that we look at are soluble in organic solvents, and you can look to see what kind of polarity organic solvent they are, and then choose your type of chromatography and your type of column from there. For large molecules over 2000 molecular weight, again, we ask about solubility, but usually what you're going to end up with as a new option is molecular exclusion chromatography, or size exclusion chromatography. In that type of chromatography, everything is based on whether your particle or your analyte is big enough to fit into a particle. Small analytes will diffuse into pores, and big analytes can't, so the big analytes will elute faster in size exclusion chromatography. Isocratic elution is when we have one solvent or a mixture of solvents with constant composition throughout the entire duration of our chromatography. We would use the information on the previous tables about solvent strength in order to choose the right eluent. In the mixtures, it's always common to call the aqueous solvent A and the organic solvent B. When you put your solvents on your HPLC, remember that. A aqueous, B organic. When we look at different isocratic elutions for a mixture of aromatic compounds on a C18 column, we can get all of these different chromatograms. Above each chromatogram is labeled how much B, organic, is used, and then you can determine how much aqueous is also used. If we have a lot of the less polar solvent, the organic solvent B, it's going to pull everything off the non-polar column very quickly, and it won't separate all the peaks. This is seen in the top left where we have 90% B. However, as we reduce the eluent strength by having less of the nonpolar organic B and more of the polar aqueous, we can make the separation slower and separate the peaks well. This is seen on the right-hand side. However, what you'll notice is that the time of this elution is going to be rather unwieldy, with the ETH compound coming out at 125 minutes. When we have that situation, we might want to do what's called gradient elution or solvent programming. This is analogous to temperature programming in GC. What we do is we change the solvent composition during chromatography in order to separate mixtures with dissimilar compounds. The example here shows a segmented gradient elution where we have an isocratic flow for a while, for about 8 minutes, and then it ramps up to another isocratic flow and then ramps again to another isocratic flow. You can do this or you can do a continuous gradient. The benefit of this should be clear if you look at the retention times on the x-axis. In this case, all eight compounds elute in 37 minutes instead of the 125 minutes. Alternatively, you can do a linear gradient elution. You don't always have to hold at a particular solvent strength. In other words, you don't always have to do segments. The chromatograms on the right-hand side here are showing different linear gradient elutions, where you can go from different ranges over different amounts of time. As you can see, in panel B, we've now achieved the elution of all compounds with good resolution in 31 minutes. How do we develop an HPLC method? There are so many things that we can alter. Well, here's the thing. HPLC is actually pretty easy once your method is developed, but developing your method isn't exactly easy. So here are the things that are easy and hard to change on a continuum. Easy to change is to change the solvent strength by simply varying the fraction of each solvent that you're using. This will adjust your mobile phase strength. Another thing that's pretty easy to change is the temperature, so long as you have a column oven. You can also change the pH, where you want to use small steps on pH and look up the pKa values of your samples. Then, if you need to, you can change out your solvent completely or switch to using a different kind of stationary phase. But usually that's the last resort because columns cost a fair amount of money. We do have starting conditions. It's wise to go and look in the literature or look in your textbooks for what normal conditions are to start with. And when I say normal, I mean customary, not necessarily normal phase. So here's a table of starting conditions for reverse phase chromatography tells you a little bit about flow rate, 
tells you a little bit about what stationary phase to use, temperature, sample size. And so we see, well, let's start out with two microliters and we'll look at acetonitrile and water because that seems like a good place to start. Often your best separation is going to be obtained when you have a mixture of solvents, possibly three solvents. In that case, you can use the HPLC method development triangle, where you do a separation with each of the individual solvents, and then with equal mixtures of them, and then you can extrapolate where within all of that you want to be. An example is here. This is showing the actual chromatogram with the different positions on that triangle, and it lets you see which peaks will be resolved under what conditions. You can use this to set up your gradient. All right, applications. HPLC is used for a huge quantity of things. It's used in drug analysis, biochemistry, food preservation, industry, looking at pollutants for pesticides, forensic science, looking at blood alcohol level and drug and determining who died from what purpose, and also for clinical chemistry, the test that your doctor is going to have. This is a pretty cool example of the separation of all of our amino acids in one HPLC program, where we have a low element strength to start with, then we have a gradient that ramps up in two different stages, and we are able to detect all of them with good resolution over the course of a little bit under an hour. Now let's talk briefly about the different types of chromatography. What many people think about when they think about chromatography is adsorption chromatography. Strictly, this is if you have a solid stationary phase, and then you have a fluid mobile phase. In that case, your analyte is going to adsorb onto the surface of the solid, and then if it's adsorbed strongly, it's going to travel slowly. Most of our HPLC, and honestly most of our GC, is not adsorption chromatography. Most of HPLC and GC is partition chromatography, where we have actually a liquid-liquid interaction. In GC, we have this high boiling liquid stationary phase bonded to the solid surface, and you see here the open tubular column that we expect to see. In HPLC, it's the same thing. You may not think of it, but really the C18 is a non-volatile liquid that is bonded to our silica columns, and that's the truth in HPLC as well. So the separation is based on the equilibration between the liquid stationary phase and the flowing mobile phase. Earlier I mentioned that if we have large analytes, then we might want to use molecular exclusion chromatography. This is also called size exclusion chromatography, or sometimes gel permeation chromatography, or gel filtration. In this case, we have a porous stationary phase, and you have a liquid or a gas mobile phase. You separate the molecules by their size. Large molecules are excluded from the pores and will elute quickly. Smaller molecules are able to diffuse into the pores and will take longer to elute. We also have affinity chromatography. This is extremely selective. It's often used to purify a single protein out of a mixture of thousands of proteins. This is a multi-step kind of chromatography, not necessarily a constant flow like we're used to thinking about. What you do is you have an immobilized molecule in the stationary phase. Then the solute is going to be attracted to that. The column captures just that analyte and all the others flow through. This is usually using some sort of antibody antigen type of reaction. Then in a second step, you need to get your analyte off the column. So you're going to change the pH or the ionic strength or some other factor in order to then wash or elute your analyte off. Ion exchange chromatography is also kind of similar to affinity chromatography in that it's a multiple step. What you do here is you're going to have a resin as your stationary phase, and the resin is going to contain cations or anions. In the case of trying to separate anions, your stationary phase will be cations, and that's shown by the blue pluses here. So your anions that you're trying to analyze are going to penetrate the pores and interact with the positive ions on this resin. Then, once you've got that happening and you pass through all of your solution, your anions will hold on to it, and then you will elute everything with a strong mobile phase, which is usually a salt solution to wash them off. Looking a little bit more deeply at what the stationary phase might look like for ion exchange chromatography, in this case, for cation exchange resin, we have SO3- ions bonded to a phenyl group on an alkane. The charge is balanced out by protons, and so we start out with a very acidic cation exchange resin. When you put your sample in the column, your sample, perhaps sodium plus, needs to displace the protons from the cation exchange resin. In contrast, for anion exchange resin, you're going to have some positively charged species bound to the resin with a negative cation, like chloride, and your sample will displace the chloride. 
Elution of ions from one of these ion exchange columns can be seen as shown here. On the left-hand side, we have anion separation, and on the right-hand side, we have cation separation. As you go on with time, you're going to see things that are bonded more strongly to the cation or anion exchange resin. The last form of liquid chromatography that I want to discuss briefly is thin layer chromatography, where you have a plate or a piece of paper that you spot your sample on and let the liquid wick up the length of the plate using capillary action. As it moves forward, you're going to get a different solvent front, and then you're going to have different spots for your samples. The migration distance is going to be relative to retention time in column chromatography. One of the nice things about TLC is that it can be two-dimensional. You can use one solvent in one dimension. In this case, we have a sample at the beginning in the bottom left of the plate, so it's just a dot. And then we use solvent A to go from bottom to top, and then we take the plate out, rotate it 90 degrees, and put it in solvent B to go from left to right. And that's going to separate things out based on two parameters. Thank you for listening, and I hope this was helpful.